Welcome, welcome everyone. Come on in to our virtual space. Welcome to the latest version of the latest of our virtual events at the American Writers Museum. We're gonna give everybody a few minutes to, uh, to file into the room. It's a, a narrow doorway, but you'll all make it eventually. Uh, hang up your coats, find your seats, so to speak. One of the advantages of doing these virtual programs is that we can reach people, so many people outside of the Chicago area, but the disadvantage is that I can't hear you if you laugh at my jokes. So we're just gonna pretend that you're all laughing. Just a few short housekeeping things uh, before we begin tonight. As you're watching this conversation, if you have a question, we'd like you to type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We're going to be monitoring that for questions at the end of our conversation. And we may contact you via the chat or we may read your question out. If you like the kinds of online programs that you've seen from us, you can become a member and get advanced notice of special programs and offers, including our upcoming writer discussion series that will begin soon. Our YouTube channel has videos posted of programs from the past three years. You can check that as well for news and updates. Our book selling partner, both when we're here and online and when we're open, is Seminary Co-op Bookstore. And you can order online from them or from our bookshop.org page as well. Once we begin, I'm going to drop the link to tonight's uh, book into the chat. So take a look there um, for your purchasing needs. We're grateful to all of you for being here and for valuing the past, present, and future of American writing. My name is Allison Sansoni, and I'm the program director here at the museum. This program is the latest in the Jean and John Rowe program series, My America, Immigrant and Refugee Writers Today. It's presented in conjunction with the exhibit of the same name, which can be viewed at our museum on Michigan Avenue in Chicago, or online at my-america.org. The exhibit and series honors the contributions to American writing from those Americans who came here or whose ancestors came here from worlds away. Tonight, we're joined by poet, writer, and translator Khaled Matoa, whose newest collection of poems, Fugitive Atlas, charts the world's refugee crisis, ecological degradation, and military occupations through the lives of those within that upheaval offering humanity and hope in exploring their voices and dreams. He is a MacArthur Fellow and the author of four collections of poetry, including Tocqueville, and is the translator of nine books of contemporary Arabic poetry, including Saadi Yousef's Without an Alphabet, Without a Face. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for being here with us tonight. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me. Glad to be here. I wanted to start by um, by talking a little bit about your new book and, and the idea of an atlas and the place it describes. How, how did you settle on this image for your collection? Uh, <clears throat> it's very interesting. I mean, the, the idea of the book being a, a large scope a book covering, you know, a, a period of time, uh, concerns, large topics, uh, places uh, <clears throat> was always in the manuscript, but it wasn't the the original title. We I thought of something called the book of something. It was the the book of difficult times or whatever. But it was it was uh, it, it you know it wasn't like one uh, topic that you could give it uh, <clears throat> a title and you'll be there. It seemed to uh, need uh, an, an idea of, a, of a, a, an emphatically self-conscious book or that's, that's broad. And so uh, Atlas was, uh, was something to settle on because of the variety of places uh, and uh, the variety of difficulties encountered. And I think it reference to movement. And when you think of a lot of, you know, the difficulties people are facing are, have a lot to do with limited movement, inability to access resources or to move on from a part of the world which has run out of water or, or the ground is no longer 
uh, Arab or, or whatever. Uh, so it's um, <clears throat> it's come from that need to uh, of direction, uh, but also it's become a sort of a chronicle of the difficulties that one encounters one when flight is is the course that one ends up taking. So Atlas is. Um, uh, is it's a fugitives atlas if you can think of the title that way it's also a sense of a shifting atlas because the word fugitive also comes from watercolors and watercolors that kind of bleed into other colors and get fogged up and so on are called fugitive colors so all of these kind of worked with the idea of a a blurred a uh, sense of destination, uh, the need to look up the landscape and to try to find your way anyway, and uh, um, you know the fact that it's 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 a it's a it's a muddled uh, world, and so the cover kind of um, takes care of that at least visually, even though the color the cover is actually a real picture from a satellite dish. It's not a fake painting or anything. It is from up there and it is a cloud pattern over the desert. I don't know how the color ended up being that way, but that's uh, that's what it looked up from the satellite. So it seemed altogether perfect as an image, as a title and an encapsulation of the book. The other, the final thing is that one of the, my first reviewers of my book was a professor at Texas. She passed away a few years ago. Her name is Barbara Harlow and, and she described my work and this is the fifth book, not, not the fourth. She described my, um, the, my first book as a, a kind of a new cartography in that I was sort of presenting a, a different route or landscape or territory that I was charting given that I was also writing poems located in different places. So uh, cartographer it is and an atlas maker I will ever well, forever be, I guess. <laughs> the, it's, it's interesting that you, you talk about the, the satellite, the view from the satellite, because we, you know, those of us outside of a conflict tend mm -hmm. to view it from above, you know, but you deliberately chose the voices of people directly affected by what we, you know, very airily call geopolitical forces. Yeah. Why, why did you choose to center those voices? Um, I think, um, one is uh, um, I, I, maybe one of the great statements I've learned um, over the years an encapsulation, maybe even a misquote um, is uh, grace is the gift of the other. Uh, this is from Bakhtin, uh, the, great, the, the great Russian philosopher, literary critic. Grace is the gift of the other, that I have no self uh, sorry, um, self is the grace of the other, a gift of the other. So in a sense, there is no self to be gifted to us or to be owned except from the other. Uh, the other aspect uh, that Bhaktin also talks about is that we have, we have excess <clears throat> of, uh, of uh, seeing. We, have, we see more than we need to see. Uh, that there's a lot that we see that that doesn't get into incorporated into our lives as such, and this capacity to to excess excessively see or to see more than we need is really sort of the provenance of of empathy. We have more feelings to be had than we have for ourselves. When I see somebody hit by a car or shot or stabbed or even pricked by a pin or something, you could just feel like this, this sensation of, uh, of, uh, of feeling. So we have this, this ability to, to transcend our limitations uh, and, um, uh, and to feel what others feel, to feel for others, um, not exactly what they feel, but we, we can comprehend. And, and that's, um, that's for everyone. 
that's you know that's the, all of us uh, are capable of that but it becomes uh, you know it's and it's also the business of writing i mean if you're a novelist and you write about seven or eight characters you make them up from zero you imagine all of them if you're omniscient if not whatever it is you're you're conceiving of all of these lives because of this excess of seeing and feeling and so uh being a poet is not that different from being a novelist or a dramatist and so if you're devoted to a subject or it moves you then it's um you know then you you just go and in, into trying to to what what might this person be thinking what might this person be thinking and how could this be and and you you know you pick with the people with your sympathetic toward and then you say well what, what about this this person who traffics in this and the person who imprisons people and the person who maybe tortures or gets tortured and and it's um i'm it's it's not perfect it's not even right uh, maybe in the sense of you never get it quite right but it's uh, it's it's that ability to to engage with with situations, uh, with uh, personalities, with different experiences by learning more, uh, that you could perhaps in, inhabit these spaces. So um, so yeah. So coming to the voices, it seemed to me like uh, that was how you you conveyed it, how you portrayed it, was to try to occupy as many positions uh, and, uh, you know, not a feeling as possible uh, in order to, to understand. And, and those, those sounds are out there and the, the journalists have done their work, the researchers have done their work in terms of conveying the, the facts. Then it becomes the artist or the poet or the dramatist to try to uh, pull it together into a, into a, a moving story, I hope. Yeah, as a as a poet, do you do you choose the form first, or do you choose the imagery? I'm um, trained more for the for the towards the image, uh, you know that sort of. Uh, but they but so they sort of come together. I mean, I've never written a thin poem, knowing that I'm going to write a thin poem first. It just seems like the. The thinness came with the with the with the content. Uh, I would say that, but it it wasn't even that difficult uh, because it was the writing happens <clears throat> in the middle. So maybe I will start writing a poem without wanting to write it in 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 three line stanzas. But once I've written a few lines and I take it into the computer and try to finish it and so on. Uh, then it begins to be shaped that way. So that the strategic formal decision in this uh, uh, piece was to um, to write all the verse in three line stanzas in tercets. And as you can see, some of them are long and some of them are are short. Some of them are skinny. Some of them are wide. But everything uh, was in in three lines. There, you know, I can't really. And that's probably as arbitrary a choice as I made in the book. Uh, I wanted to uh, have a consistent stanza, perhaps to force a kind of a, an elementary uh, or sort of a basic uh, unity, a sense of unity that all of these uh, are stamped with that uh, three line stanza. That's, that's the, that would, you know, that's sort of like a, a kind of a DNA. Uh, to to all of these to force uh, them to be thought of together. Some of the stanzas end with, uh, you know, um, uh, a period or uh, the the lines have end stops with a comma and so on. And some of them are in gem, but all of them are three. There are some uh, high buns or, or prose poems uh, that are that have some verse at the bottom, and uh, those two are done in a tercet or one kind or another. So um, uh, so it comes together, but in this case, uh, the shape of the stanza was one that was decided on before and uh, helped shape the poems eventually. The, the idea of searching for home, 
runs, you know, throughout your work. What what is the place where you feel most at home, and has that changed for you over the years? Uh, I mean, um, I think the there is um, as much as a desire for that, as much as uh, there is uh, a kind of resistance. The desire is yes, you want. Uh, to be settled uh, and comfortable wherever you are, to to have a, a life of 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 engagement, of happiness, of growth, of development, definitely. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you would want to have the ability to to move uh, and to create community where um, where. Uh, you you can do that. You don't want to have a you know a, a, a situation where movement debilitates you. So it's it's uh, it's as much the 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 desire to be home or to find home or to find rest, but it's also the fact that this is uh, the anxiety about why not have it. Why is it so difficult to? Uh, to belong, to feel at home, to contribute in some places. So I guess in in some ways, uh, it is something that that both haunts uh, my story, but it also one that um, that I that I wanted to celebrate because uh, I've moved around uh, and I've been able learned after some time uh, to come back. I mean, it's uh, and to create community and to be in multiple communities at the same time. Okay, digitally, maybe, of course, physically it's impossible, but you can stay with your friends in Libya and, and stay in touch with them. And those friends there in that same place are different from the community that's your family, from the ones that are in Egypt, from the ones that are scattered. So um, I think, uh, you know, home ultimately is the place where you are happy but also your place where you are doing the most good it is a, a combination of uh, of uh, virtue uh, self fulfillment uh, uh, that you are acting up to your own potential and it's joy and and happiness and and okay there are people that are involved in political resistance and are struggling and that are fighting and so on but these people are involved in virtue and that makes them happy. Uh, happiness is not uh, as much as I was uh, envy my friends who are by the wonderful beaches, wherever they are. Happiness is not about just uh, having a pina colada and being by the, you know, by the beach. It is, you know, feeling fulfilled psychologically, philosoph philosophically, if you will, spiritually. And sometimes that's not about relaxing. It's about really being engaged and and being uh, putting up effort towards improving life and community and and even the environment, which is we are seeing all over as a as a highly polluted place that needs to be repaired. So, you know, wherever you are doing virtue and doing it in community, I think that's the place. Where uh, where home becomes because it's it's the place of a uh, of uh, the the psyche and the soul uh, finding nourishment by giving it as well. That's wonderful. Yeah, I just want to remind folks that are watching along if you have a question um, to type it into our Q and A box so that we can uh, read that out a little bit later. Um, I wanted to ask what what was your journey to the United States? What were the circumstances, and you know what was your first experience, sort of 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 writing in the U.S. Uh, the journey uh, the journey between coming and writing is also kind of long. Uh, you know that's why I needed this atlas all the time. I needed to know where I was going. Uh, in fact, well, <laughs> maybe writing is where I began to create an atlas, to tell you the truth. Uh, but I came to the United States at the age of 15. I had just finished, uh, uh, in America, you would mi mi finish middle school, which is middle school in America is eight years, but in Libya and the Middle East, it's the, the ninth year. And uh, normally people, 
either went to college after their college degree or after high school, but my family sort of expedited the process, uh, partly because of the political circumstances in Libya, the schools were not becoming, were not, uh, were becoming just sort of um, somewhat dangerous, uh, meaning that there was uh, the militarized schools, the army was taking over schools, uh, there were uh, um, a lot of suspicion and oppression within the country. This is in, under Gaddafi's regime when he became, when he really grabbed, uh, he really controlled the country and grabbed all the reins of power. And it became a much more sort of uh, idiosyncratic situation where you never knew when you're in danger or not and so forth. So my brother had uh, gone to college here and uh, some cousins, Mississippi is where I landed in my first state in the United States. And so uh, they said, well, why don't you join them? And this is, goes back to an earlier tradition in my family where they were sending boys to finish high school in Egypt because in some parts of Libya, you know, I think in the 1940s, maybe there were only two operational high schools in the whole country after World War II. And World War II, people forget that World War II really you know, decimated my city, Benghazi and other parts of Libya. So um, uh, uncles had gone to Egypt to finish high school. Uh, it wasn't strange for the family. It was just a further place. Uh, but back then people went to Egypt by car and it took them three or four days to get there. And going to America by airplane may have not seemed <laughs> all that far. So so that was the, a tradition of, of, of uh, diaspora or exile education as something to be sought as distant as possible. Uh, if need be, you travel far for it, no, no problem. You gotta go get it. So America was the, the place, the visas were easy. My brother was here, my uh, older cousins were here. And then I studied English at a, at a, at a college to study English, but then I had to finish high school uh, at a Catholic uh, high school in Louisiana. And then uh, I think college, the beginning of college was the beginning of wandering really, because I didn't know what I wanted to study. I didn't know what, uh, whether to, to actually study or just to read the books that I loved. I sort of meandered for a few years, managed to keep my status as a legal student all the time. But eventually I discovered that I'm in the humanities, that's my field and I began to write for the college newspaper. And in my last year of college, I took a poetry workshop uh, and, um, and that was that. That was at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. So my first 10 years were all in uh, the South, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, Tennessee. And uh, so by the time I was uh, 24 is when I finished college. I was uh, I was uh, ready to be a writer of some sort. And I already published some poems and so on. So uh, a compressed version of it is um, somebody who's uh, kind of uh, inclined towards reading, towards the art, not knowing what they do, what to do, what to uh, sort of explore. And by the time of you know fifteen years in your country and seven, eight, nine, ten years abroad, where you're you know, you have to find yourself and know your stories and tell your stories and try to figure out how to move around in the world. Uh, all of that was, you know, where the arts came the place to express that and poetry was, was the place to do that. And even then, a, a lot of the poems were persona poems or dramatic monologues where already the, the, uh, the awareness that this ability to act to voice, to think, to contemplate feelings that one did not have necessarily in one's life or experiences that one had not experienced, but one can try to imagine deeply. That was with me from, from then on. Like the third section of uh, my first book, Ismaili Eclipse, uh, has many uh, multiple voices that are, that are versions of me, but that are not me myself, as Walt Whitman says. What were the, you mentioned just a, a moment ago, wanting to read the books that you loved. What, what were those books? Uh, 
Uh, one book uh, that was not assigned that caused me to uh, basically, uh, you know, miss a midterm exam in architecture and uh, late on a project in <laughs> architecture was the diary of Malcolm X. Um, I stole to Alex Haley or the autobiography. Another was a great book that's not mentioned a lot. It's called The Road to Mecca by Muhammad Assad. Uh, these two books, particularly, I just said, you know, the hell with the exam. I'm just going to sit there and, and read them. And there were others, but these two are the main culprits. <laughs> My failed career in architecture is uh, due to <laughs> Alex Haley's excellent writing. <laughs> Well, the architecture world's loss is is surely poetry's gain. Well, I hope so. <laughs> architecture hasn't called me back. <laughs> <laughs> what other uh, what other American writers had had influence on you? Um, well, I think later on, once I began to really want to write, uh, I think Whitman became the, a real occupation in poetry. The four greats who um, all you know really uh, uh, held me were um, were not American. They were all translated poets, and it sort of makes sense. Kavafi, uh, uh, Constantine Kavafi from Greece, Nazim Hikmet from Turkey, um, Garcia Lorca, probably the first poet that I really uh, leapt into. So this is somebody from the Eastern Mediterranean, the North Central Mediterranean, the Western Mediterranean. So. They were people who were, and then um, uh, a different kind of poet, but further out is uh, uh, the, I think one book that was very important to me, but Vallejo, Cesar Vallejo from Peru uh, was a, a poet that uh, I really loved a great deal. So those, some of the early poems were, were from there. I can't quite remember uh, what the, the first book of American poetry that held me, but it was an anthology by um, A. Poulin anthology of contemporary American poetry, and that's that I read through. That I read poets like uh, Philip Levine and Adrian Rich and uh, and John Logan and Sylvia Plath and uh, uh, Robert Lowe and uh, Robert Hayden, uh, all of them were uh, poets whose work that I that I sort of imbibed. I can I can when I, when I went through that anthology, I uh, I saw many of my thefts staring at me. <laughs> so you took that one from this one and that one from that one and this one from this one. Uh, so yeah, so that's um, so I, I it was sort of like so the the the, the a kind of canon of uh, mid-century or you know second half of the 20th century American poetry was uh, was uh, Eliot too I mean proof rock I mean I remember memorizing proof rock early on and just having that kind of music in my head uh, so with with the uh, yeah yeah so that's that's a lot of names but uh, I would say that my first years were reading the translated poetry Charles Simic was uh, one of the poets who just sat me down and made me, you know, his stories is uh, inspiring for all of us immigrants, also coming to the U.S. at the age of 15 and, uh, you know, becoming a major American poet, uh, you know, uh, in you know, just an important American poet. So, yeah, so he was, you know, one of those poets that I, that I read and paid attention to. That's interesting that you grab that you gravitated towards the the translated poetry and you you worked as a translator yourself. What what is that like mm -hmm. in terms of your approach to that work versus creating your own original work? Well, I think and I mentioned this in some of my writing is that when I, when I was reading Lorca, for example, in in uh, like early on, I also one day stumbled on some uh, uh, at a at an ethnic store in Atlantic on Atlantic Avenue in Brooklyn, I went to. I had a dinner. It was a complete solitary, uh, alienated uh, foreigner experience. Uh, find your ethnic food, and then what else are you going to do? I went to this ethnic store, and they happened to have uh, alongside the cassettes and the 
the canned beans from Egypt and Lebanon and so on. They had tiny little books supported by Mahmoud Darwish, who was the uh, the uh, the great Palestinian poet. He passed away in 2008. He was very, very, very popular. And he the, the books were like, you know, pocket sized books. Uh, and they met, those books made it over to uh, to that shop and some just they were thrown somewhere and I picked up as many as I could. And uh, that was the poetry that I didn't know it very well, but it was when I began to read it, so, you know, I, I know this voice, I know this poetry. Uh, I want something in English to to capture this because that would be my voice in a way, that, that the poems I've not been able to write, I've been, let me if I write a surrealist poem this way or that way, the symbols that I thought I would be wanting to write about, uh, I was sort of at a loss, you know, um, uh, or even, the, you know, mentioning particular trees as opposed to others, when Mahmoud Darwish, sort of in Arabic, oh, I want to know, mention that tree, and you, you don't know it. So in English, you, you don't know the tree you want to mention, but in your native language, you, you, maybe it's mentioned, and then you say, oh, okay, that's that's the tree. I, that, I need to find the English word for that tree to mention in the poem that I wanted to write. So in a way, translation was, was practice. First of all, it was very good poetry. So you, your challenge is to say, well, I know poetry, huh, a little bit, Maybe if I can make this very good poetry sound like good poetry in English, that's that's a good challenge. You know, it's, it's a good exercise. Almost like you're you're you know you're playing piano, trans, just like playing an instrument, figuring out your instrument. And with that, I think came the sense of of um, of um, uh, of of the world that you could bring in. So translation was a way that allowed me, oh, I can say this in English, or this can be smuggled into English. English allows this. And I had not seen many translations of Darwish before I began to translate them. And later on, I found out that a lot of it had been translated, but not that much. But it was my practicing of it was to legitimate the landscape, the voice, the sentiment, all of that is what translating translation has sort of uh, has allowed. And I, I think it was a kind of marker. I mean, I, I remember like two poems that I wrote at that very, on that very visit in New York that basically uh, kind of, th those are the poems, they were in my first book. Those are the poems that I worked on for several years, but those are the poems that said, okay, I think I know what I'm going to write about. And so, you know, Lorca's poet in New York, Mahmoud Darwish being translated, uh, me saying, well, okay, I have a license to do this and a license to do this. Uh, that's where translation, what it did at the beginning. Later on, I think it it was um, really a process of, of, of wanting to have, uh, you know, bodies of work next to yours in some ways. I wanted to, to you know, again, it's like the excess of of seeing, or maybe the excess of talking. Like I talk too much, I might as well translate. Uh, <laughs> so that was like, I, I could do a lot of poetry. Yeah, I, I can't force my imagination to write a lot of poetry, but maybe I'll give one side of the imagination rest and use the skills uh, of, of writing proficiently, tightly uh, with some awareness and skill Maybe I can bring that into into this, these Arab poets who, who who might not be read if I didn't render them in English. Uh, so it was the excess desire for poetry. Translation was uh, again. It, it was I could translate when I'm uh, when I, I remember my father was ill at some point and he was lying in his bed and I could sit and translate. When we moved to an apartment and he would rest in his, I could translate. There was it wasn't. It was writing and poems and loving what you're producing to some extent, and you know, and being happy that you're producing poetry. But it didn't exert that sort of creativity, um, that anxiety that you have when you're writing your own poems. And you're filled with poetry in some ways. You know, you your hand is moving. Sometimes you say, oh, "Let me stop translating. Let me write something." Um, it's all in the playing. It's, I'm at the piano as, as a musician, if you will, all the time. I'm playing Bach or Adonis or Sadi Youssef or whatever it is 
and then okay but i think i have a moment for myself here let me write that and it was all continuous if you will when you're when you're working in multiple languages do mm -hmm. you are there concepts or ideas that you you find easier to express in one language versus another well, I work only in Arabic and English, and I've lately I've reversed. And now I translate more to Arabic than I translate to English. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, I sometimes it's so spontaneous that, okay, this is a concept. It's going to take me three words instead of two to say it, or maybe three words to give a feeling of what really happened, of what I, what I think is actually being said. To give a feeling for it, than I would in uh, in, uh, in 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 English. That I would need a few more words in, in Arabic than in English. Than, I mean, sorry, in English than in Arabic. Sometimes it's the other way around too. So uh, it's so spontaneous that I don't I don't think that there's anything that that can stop any translation. Uh, you know, uh, we were somebody was telling me about a joke about the United States sort of English, where um, in America you say horseback riding, and the British make fun of that. It's like horseback. What are you going to ride the front of the horse, or who's going to ride? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so. Uh, but then, is that the work of a translator? Is that like a like somebody translating this activity too much? So, uh, when you do these kinds of things. Um, whether you add the word back or not to something that may be clear, it is just, it, it, you do it spontaneously. Uh, and if it makes sense, it sticks. So I guess I, some translations are very difficult. It's interesting. I find translating prose sometimes more difficult than poetry, maybe because it's, it's more restrictive or maybe in poetry, I feel that I, I can have the greater license in some ways to be a, a poet. I, I, I'm not sure why prose is more difficult. Uh, or maybe just because poetry is more fun as a, as a, as a textual uh, uh, exercise. But at any rate, uh, it, it, I don't really feel that there is anything that, um, that can hinder. And I think it's in the effort. Uh, the um, the, 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 I was looking at a lot of translations recently of older Arabic poetry, and it does take, it does take sometimes like a, a sentence of six words might take up to 10 words in English. Some people tell me that in Russian it's different, like 10 words in Russian can be rendered in, in seven words or seven syllables in English. Uh, but that's how it, it's, it, it it just you just need that maneuverability, but I don't think there's anything that that hinders. Uh, we've been translating all of our existences, you know. I mean, if you look at how the English, how many how many accents are still very different in England. In America, we don't have that, but in England, they're, they're, like the way the Dorset this sounds different from Yorkshire, from Wales, from Scotland, from Ireland. I mean, I, these people kept the way they're talking, but that's how different languages really are. And we either, and they were speaking the same language. So we either kind of find a middle accent that you, unifies us and we speak together, uh, communicate. We're always translating. There's, there isn't a way in which my language and yours are, are not different, even when we're speaking the same language. So translation is, is the most basic, element of, of communication. And we're already trying to often ex express something that's, uh, that's, you know, that's not readily expressible. So we're translating, even when we talk, we're translating. So um, there isn't anything that culturally from this place that another place cannot understand. You, it is easy to dismiss but to say you cannot understand, I think is is not uh, is is that's not that's that gets to be a little bit on the on the on the it becomes politics. It doesn't become people wanting to know what they're saying to each other. Yeah. Yeah. 
So in a couple of minutes, we're going to start um, with audience questions. So I'd like folks to type those into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen here, um, and we'll, we'll read those out. But first, I wanted to ask um, if you'd read to us a little bit from, from Fugitive Atlas. And again, the, the link to purchase that book is in our chat box. So I'll read, again, the book is uh, all over the place. Um, but I'll try to read um, maybe uh, uh, maybe some of the more uh, American poems, if you will. Um, here's, here's a poem about a place. I don't, maybe before that, I'll read, I'll read uh, a poem called Beatitudes. And it takes us from, uh, from a creation story until uh, uh, you know uh, a more you know environment story, cultural story, and it's a conversation between a, a father and a daughter, child. Beatitudes. My child wants to know if the mountains really cowered. How do you know when a sea or a river is afraid? How do you know when the sky is thinking yes or no? And him, Adam, why did he say yes? Did he know that all the other creatures refused the burden, that he was God's last choice? It's one poem, uh, but it's also scattered throughout the book. So, the attitude too. Did you really have a party the day the dictator died and you had a cake decorated with all the flags? Did you think his death will fix everything? Why did we spend all that time over there? And all these people fleeing and fighting and drowning, what are they hoping for? The attitude three. She speaks to me in our language, in front of her for her friends, to share a secret or cool and beaming to show off. I wonder how long it will last this pride, this intimacy. Sometimes she puts her arm next to mine and tells me I have the lighter skin. Why are you doing this, I ask? but she doesn't point to the flag or say it's the way of the world. Instead, she tells me not to worry that she is the most kid kid in her class, the least mature one, Baba. Not all kinds of wisdom console, I tell her. Then I begin to think of words she'll soon hear that can make her wish she wasn't who she is. Lead me to virtue, O oh love, through the smoke of despair. And the last section of this poem is four. Let's walk through the woods, she tells me. Let's walk through the rocky shore at sunrise. Let's walk through the clover fields at noon. In the rainforest, she is silent, mesmerized. She'd never prayed, we never taught her. But she seemed to then, eyes alert with joy. She points to a chameleon the size of a beetle teaches me the names of flowers and trees, insects we can eat if we're ever lost here. I'm teaching you how to entrust the world to me, she says. You don't have to live forever to shield me from it. And I'll read, uh, slightly longer one, but I think it speaks to our moment, to our anxieties, perhaps. This is called, and it's an American poem, if you will. It jumps around a lot, but 
everything, if I jump to one stone, I'll come back to it. So don't worry. We're all, it's, 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 it, 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 uh, it makes the rounds and it comes back. After Charlottesville, for days after, this was always coming, muscles taut to the smell of first arrival, the scent of an old fire in the woods, pioneers, Naipaul called them, maddened and bearing torches, a primitive born of civilization itself, a friend who once tended to Jefferson's fox gloves comes to mind as you watch the stream movie to see the great actor express. What is the Arabic word for deja vu? A dream released from restrictive facts, a murderer's face of indifference, the mind desperate to see things anew. You want a picture, the obsession with ancestry like a tangle of boughs. Ezra pounds boughs, Mussolini hung upside down, the boughs covered with snow, dripping blood. You want footage of the cigarette break, soldiers smoking after the bodies had been hauled from the gas chamber. You look at your roof and wonder if it's time to install solar panels. Surely this is not your first encounter with this sort of thing. The immigration officer says, welcome home. Somehow it sounded like, welcome to my home. You remember the face of the butcher's assistant. You'd gone to the shop and picked a lamb from the pen in the back. Yes, the lamb, it was braying clover, clover. And in 15 minutes, what do you call an animal's body after it's slaughtered and skinned? Strange there isn't a word in English for that, considering the innards, heart, lung, and liver in a plastic bag if you want them. And the blood, the blood is deja vu. And it's always Othello's, how in Aleppo once I took by the throat the circumcised dog and smote him thus. Desdemona lies sleeping in D.W. Griffith's arms. That's why these woods are no longer mere background. The scent of an old rapture and this enigma of a current buried in the spine. Of course he can say welcome. If it's his decision to let you in or not, but that's not the only difference between displace and replace. Their flags emblazoned with axes and saws announce a new kind of math, a new look for the old machinery droning to convince you it's your people who are sick in the head. As you drove away, you saw the man who transfigured the lamb all cleaned up, hair combed, almost smelled the soap on his hands, waiting for the microbus home. Maybe someday you'll go to college here, you tell your daughter as you enter Monticello. It's time for you to donate that old car to the radio station, she instructs you. Looking at photographs of lynchings, your eyes avert the martyr's unbearable holiness, and you gaze and gaze and gaze at the leering familiar faces. All right. Well, I wish we were all in a room together so that we could all applaud. Thank you. The Thank way you. that we would, to, the way that we would if we could all, if we could all be together. But thank you very much for that. Well, great. Thank you. While we're while we're waiting, and we do have time for a couple of questions, um, if we people would like to to type those in to the Q and A box, if there's something you'd like to know, I did want to ask you while we're waiting to see if any come in. I did want to ask you who you're reading now, who who really interests and excites you. Um, I'm reading a novel by uh, Mohsen Hamid. Uh, moth smoke that I like a lot. Um, and um, 
So what uh, contemporary poetry that I've read most recently, I'm, I have to go back and check, uh, but, uh, um, and also there, as an editor of Michigan Quarterly Review, we were reading all the time, we were assembling uh, an issue from our anniversary. We've had to read almost all of 60 years of our magazine, we found a wonderful poetry by Adrian Rich, a poem by Louis Turco. So um, I can I must say that at two or three months, I have not really kept up with the most uh, recent uh, uh, writings, but I think that this novel is, uh, is quite fantastic. Um, and uh, the names are escaping me at the moment. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but that's uh, uh, just reading some older materials. And uh, Philip Levine, we have a poem coming up in his um, in that same issue. He's always a, a poet that I've always come back to. And uh, Yusuf Kuminyaka is always somebody that I, that I read uh, most recently. Um, uh, an old collection that I was reading for a second time called Magic City. Thank you very much for, for being here with us tonight. We really appreciate you, you taking the time to, to talk with us about your new book, which is uh, Fugitive Atlas. And we've got the link up in the chat to purchase that from our book selling partner. But um, thank you to everyone who's who's attended and we hope to see you on our YouTube live tomorrow night um, and on our Facebook page to celebrate the release of 250 years of struggle and song from our uh, friends at Library of America. But Helen Metalla, thank you so much for for being here. We appreciate it. Sure. Thank you very much. Thanks thank so much. You. Have a good night.